So let's get started. Oh, well, we've just kicked up to 20. You guys wow. are drawing quite a crowd. <laughs> All right. So everyone, welcome to Who Writers Read. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Ginger Eager. And I'm Jody Forster. And thanks for so much for joining Who Writers Read. It's a monthly literary salon featuring writers who will discuss their reading lives, the books that have influenced and inspired their own work, and which books they are reading now. Our guest today is the novelist memoir, and memoirist, sorry, memoirist uh, Martha Cooley, whose latest book, Buy Me Love, is a fascinating book at the parallels uh, lives of two characters, both struggling with uh, questions or with the dilemmas of money and art. Uh, our second joining the conversation is the memoirist and essayist, Sven Burkertz, whose latest book is the memoir, Nabokov, uh, sorry, Vladimir Nabokov's Speak Memory. It's, uh, it's, it's a deep, critical look at Nabokov's well-known memoir, Speak Memory. All right. So we're going to open, as we always do, with a reading from each of our each of our guests tonight. So Martha was volunteered actually to start <laughs> and kindly agreed. Um, I'm going to read her bio and then she'll give us a reading. So our first guest is Martha Cooley. Martha's most recent novel is Buy Me Love. Her novel, The Archivist was a national bestseller. She is also the author of the novel, 33 Swoons and a memoir guesswork. She co-translated Antonio Tabucci's story collection, Time Ages in a Hurry. Her essays, short fiction, and co-translations have appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books and numerous leading literary journals. She directs the MFA in creative writing at Adelphi University, where she is a professor of English. Prior to Adelphi, she taught for 15 years in the Bennington Writing Seminars. She lives between Forest Hills in Queens, New York, and Castiglione del Tierzy. How did I do with that? <clears throat> I tried to find it on Google Translate, but um, I could only find the Castiglione part. <laughs> All right. Thanks so well, much, Martha. <laughs> thank you, Ginger. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Sven. It is a real pleasure to be here. I'm in Castiglione del Terziere, and I actually, my bio is a little out of date. I'm retired from Adelphi. I live here full time in Italy. So I'm zooming in at 11 o'clock at night here. It's a little dark in the background, but I'm really happy to be here and really happy to be with Sven, my old colleague and friend from Bennington. So um, I'll read you a few pages here from pretty early in the start of my new novel, Buy Me Love. It is a novel about money and chance. And the thing that kicks it off is the chance finding on the ground of a set of seven numbers by one of the protagonists who proceeds on a whim to buy a lottery ticket using those seven numbers and finds out um, that she has actually, uh, she's in possession of a winning, I mean, winning lottery ticket which upends a lot of things, rearranges the furniture as it were. Um, so this is actually the moment um, of the procurement of the ticket. And she lives in Brooklyn, New York, and this is in 2005, so not long after the start of, of um, the Iraq war, so. Jaywalking across Sixth Avenue, Ellen opened the bodega's brass handled door. Ah, that scent with an overlay of freshest coffee. The proprietor, a short oval-faced man, raised both hands in greeting. The dog by the register raised its head for a moment, then dropped back to sleep. Morning, the proprietor said in a gruff, cheerful voice. Morning, Mr. Reyes. He gestured in the direction of the avenue she had just crossed. A car sat in the middle of the intersection, waiting to turn. Immediately behind it, a beat up black Lincoln honked aggressively car services, idiots those drivers. Why can't Brooklyn have regular taxis like in the city? The Lincoln's driver leaned out of his window and began yelling at the driver ahead of him. Mr. Reyes clucked his tongue. One of these days, he said, you're gonna walk against that light and get mowed down. Those guys can't drive to save their own lives. Oh, I'll be fine, but thanks for worrying about me. 
Your usual, he reached for the coffee pot. Please, and one of those cookies your wife makes, they're so good. I haven't put them out yet, first have some of this. He handed her a paper cup filled to its brim. She, she sipped cautiously, hot, strong, reassuring. She fished a $10 bill from her pocket and handed it over. Anything smaller, asked Mr. Reyes. Oh, sorry, hang on a sec. Reaching into her bag, she pulled out her wallet, attempting to open it with one hand while stabilizing her coffee with the other. Put that cup down, said Mr. Reyes. You're gonna spill all over yourself. Setting the cup on the counter, she spread open her billfold and walked the tip of her forefinger through its contents. No singles, just larger bills. No dice, I just went to the bank last night. All I've got are twenties. Rich lady, eh? Mr. Reyes chuckled. I wish. You could be. What, rich? Yeah, you should play this new lottery game. Win big time, really big. Like what? Like a hundred million, he smiled. That's the jackpot. She sipped more coffee. But I never play. I mean, I've never even bought a lottery ticket. Too complicated, all those rules. Complicated. Pick seven numbers, see? The printed form he handed her had seven empty squares in the middle. Tiny texts swarmed across the white spaces above and below the squares. Squinting, she reached into her bag in search of her reading glasses. Mr. Reyes pointed to something like a cash register sitting on the counter near the dog, a modest white box with a small keyboard. Don't bother reading anything on that form, he said. It's all automated. All you have to do is pay your dollar and pick your numbers. They can be single or double digits, it doesn't matter. I'll punch them into that little machine and you check your TV tomorrow to see if you're the winner. I don't own a TV. Really? His brows rose. You don't get bored, do get bored. That's why I don't own a TV, he laughed. Oh well, I can't make it through a day without watching a little soccer. Plus the news, you know, if something should happen. If something should happen, I've got a radio, so I'd know, yeah. Sometimes I wonder why we do need to see everything. Who wants to watch buildings fall down over and over? Exactly. We're car bombings, suicide attacks. We got ourselves into quite the mess over there, Mr. Reyes, haven't we? Hard to believe we've been at war over two years already. Ayudanos, listen, you really should try the new lottery. It's called Pick Seven, these crazy times we live in. I just have this feeling one of my customers is gonna win big. I'll even say a prayer for you. She laughed. Who will you pray to, Mr. Reyes? A divine figure, of course, Jesus, Mohammed, Buddha. I rotate them each week. Today's Monday, I have to check my calendar. You rotate them, really? He nodded earnestly. To increase the odds, he said, look, buy a ticket and bring in your numbers tomorrow. That's when the drawing is. I'll tell you if you're a winner. Even if you don't hit the jackpot, they're giving out lots of smaller prizes. Wouldn't you like a few extra grand in your bank account or a trip to Barbados with your boyfriend? He smirked in a friendly, non-lascivious way. Ha, she said, right, my boyfriend, Casper the Friendly Ghost. Ah, uh, well, escaping to Barbados by yourself wouldn't be so bad, would it? The coffee had cooled to just the right temperature, a reprieve, a few instants in the seat of happiness. The lottery form, seven empty boxes waiting to be filled in. You'll get a cut if I win, right? You bet, Mr. Reyes's smile elongated, revealing a pair of gold capped incisors. All right, then, here's a buck. Pray to whomever you'd like. I'll take whatever help I can get. He grinned, gold teeth glinting. You'll get it. Oh, your cookie, wait, I almost forgot. I wouldn't let that happen. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. I so enjoyed the bit of dialogue between the two of them. I enjoyed it when I read it and I loved it even more hearing you read it. The intimacy of the cookie and then the flashback to the time period with the towers just falling as, you know, now we're in this mess with Afghanistan. It was great. Thank you. And, and um, the context of the, um, the Iraqi war, uh, which, you know, will continue to be influence the, the unfolding story. I really appreciated bringing that in. I always appreciate when 
stories also have the larger context of what the world is doing, what the politics are about. Thank you. All right, our next guest is Sven Burkertz. A few career highlights for Sven. He's the co-editor of Agni. He was the director of the Bennington Writing Seminars from 2007 to 2017 and the core member of its faculty from its inception. He's received grants from the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Foundation and the Guggenheim Foundation. Um, he's a well-known uh, literary critic and he's reviewed regularly for the New York Times Book Review, The New Republic, Esquire, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, Mirabella, Parnassus, The Yale Review, and others. His work often explores the fraught relationship between reading culture and electronic culture. He's the author of 11 books, including The Gutenberg Elegies, The Art of Time and Memoir, and most recently, Speak Memory, um, which is part of the Bookmark series from IG Publishing. All right. Thanks, Ben. Well, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, some of those magazines have uh, <laughs> gone, <laughs> disappeared, but I did at one point. So <clears throat> it's nice. To, Mirabella, for instance, gone. that was a while back. So this is um, appropriately has its, the backstory here has a Bennington origin in that I was having a conversation with Bennington alum and writer Alden Jones, and she had been working on a book, sort of taking on her personal relationship to Cheryl Strayed's memoir. And we got to talking, I said, God, I'd love to do something like that. Just, you know, pick a book and write about it from the point of view of my life and how it's moved in. Um, and she said, well, she gave me the name of a publisher, IG Publishing, and said, that's exactly what they're doing. They have this bookmarked series. Um, you should contact them. So I did, I emailed uh, the publisher <clears throat> who got back to me instantly, which is always a bad sign, but, um, he said, well, pitch me a title. You know, what would you like to do? And I said, I will. And then I went into a sort of deep quandary because I, there's so many books throughout my life that I could imagine writing in that way about. And each one would refract a sort of different part of whatever my preoccupations are and my experiences around that book. And I was getting nowhere. I had all these titles written down and then uh, <clears throat> well, that's just the setup. And then I, here's my moment of uh, revelation. And I too will just read for a few pages to introduce the project. <clears throat> Sorry, unable to decide, I thought to work from the other direction. Instead of thinking about one book or another, I would concentrate on my inclinations and preoccupations, trying to isolate what basic themes I am now most compelled by in my own life. The book I chose would have to offer me the best pretext for delving there. When I put the question that way, the answer came almost immediately. Vladimir Nabokov speak memory. I had no second thoughts and I knew why. Nabokov, more than most any writer I'd read, was obsessively occupied with time, with memory, and with the search for meaningful patterns in his life. So time, <clears throat> memory, patterns, my choice was not surprising. These are my own themes too. The older I get, the more these questions come alive in my thoughts. They've long since moved from conjecture to immediacy. And though really, Reading is often considered to be a passive activity. Real engagement with a book is anything but. Here with the choice of Nabokov, what had started as an itch looked to become something much more serious, something more like what Walker Percy called a search, an inner project of some urgency. And then it almost goes without saying, there is the dark delight of Nabokov's prose, language used with some such inventive accuracy is its own consideration, even as it creates and carries the content. I'm a sucker for a masterful style, never mind that as Nabokov observed on the very first page of Lolita, quote, you can always count on a murderer for a fancy prose style. His way of saying this sounds almost flip, but the more I immerse myself in his writing, 
the more I find myself picking up that vibration, some of the coldness and calculation we associate with a murderer. And this too is part of the layering that provokes me. The question can be asked, do we find certain books or do they find us? No one knows, of course, but the idea that there might be a right book at the right time remains interesting to contemplate. If at all true, it's a rare event. I have hardly ever started a book and discovered as I read that it was the very thing I needed. For that reason, it feels like great luck when it happens out of the blue. But when it does, I usually find that some subliminal thread of awareness already exists. Having spent a good part of my adult life with books, reading them, browsing them, selling them, and spending whole work days at the bookshop, reading blurbs and book jackets as I shelved, talking with customers and sampling whatever looked interesting, I've acquired a cloudy half knowing about many things. It's a mainly superficial acquisition, but one that can come in handy at pretentious literary dinner parties. And it is of course of no use at all when talking to a scholar. So after years of this book life, I was full of inklings about writers and their works. Now that I have better sense of the literary terrain, it happened more and more often that a certain mood would lead me toward a particular book. I would sense that there was something I needed and so often there was, and I've since come to trust this instinct. With Nabokov, it was somehow different. I had read and enjoyed a few of his novels in college. They were there on the shelf right alongside Speak Memory. I had, I should say, looked at that memoir once or twice, but for some reason had always put it back. It didn't seem to have much plot. <clears throat> it seemed at a glance rooted in all sorts of historical specifics. I let it stay just within arm's reach waiting for me. And then one day something happened. I can't remember the circumstance, but I was triggered and I took it down for a closer look. And the synapses sparked as soon as I opened to the first page and read, quote, the cradle rocks above an abyss and common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief crack of light between two eternities of darkness. That itself was like a sudden burst of illumination. I started right in and never looked back. I was caught, I was caught up and I stayed caught up. The lyricism, the unwinding brilliance of the sentences, the atmospheres, the coloration of its many nostalgias. I find it hard to do justice to the feeling of that first reading. It was one of those very rare instances where I trust the prose immediately I want to hurry forward and at the same time, stay back and linger. So I'll stop there. You know, what um, amazed me, entranced me, um, even empowered me reading your book, reading about um, Nabokov's speak memory is the close reading that you are, that you did of it and, uh, and that you're even capable of. I'm a reader who tends to just immerse myself in the story. I always have. And even though while I was at Bennington, I did learn many skills in terms of reading critically. In truth, since then, I've lapsed back into my default of just reading for the pleasure of it. And I read Speak Memory God so many years ago, before I went to Bennington, I'm sure even for long ago than longer ago than that. But to read your book and really get what these sentences, to appreciate what these sentences were, were um, revealing. It's an art beyond something that I can even comprehend. It's like listening to, you know, somebody playing Bach that I appreciate so much but could never even begin to understand and imagine how it could be done. So I just want to tell you that I am in awe of your of your deep comprehensions, your patience um, in ferreting out what was critical. And also I, I did read Alvin Jones' book. I think it's Wanting is the Wilderness. That's right. Yeah. And that too gave me, it was not only a book about Cheryl Strayswild, but reading about all, it was the first time I'd seen anybody blend their memoir with a, a critical reading. And as well as it being very much a craft book about how to write memoir. and. So the, that she 
brought this to your attention, I feel is you know very serendipitous. Yeah, you used the word. Um, which word did you use? <laughs> oh, you sparked me for a second. Uh, I'll have to come back to it. I had a flicker of a response, but then oh well, I would love to it away that. again. So yes, ages aging is has its um, <laughs> moments. <laughs> Oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. You said the word patience. And I was just thinking that one doesn't bring patience to something like that. But the beauty of it creates patience because you want to be there and you want to get as close as you can. And that's a sort of not much of a hurry on kind of feeling. It's settling in and, you know, absorbing. So I do a lot of that <clears throat> these days. How long did it take you to write this book? Was it a prolonged project or just no, really just? It was four months just because I was so fired up and I had so many things <clears throat> popping in. And my uh, daughter, Mara, who we spoke about earlier, she was a great sounding board. And I mentioned this somewhere, but um, she was also interested in Nabokov and she would just tell me, dad, you can't say that. Dad, you sound stupid. Dad, you sound like an old brother, you know. And that kept me, sort of tuned me into a certain uh, mode, which I was able to, I hope, sustain, so. So one question we always like to ask, and I'll, I'll ask you this first, Martha, is what was your childhood like in terms of books? Were you, were you influenced by books that you read? Were you even surrounded by books? Um, what was the literary environment of your home is, is I guess the question I'm asking. Well, yeah, influence, check, uh, surrounded, check. Um, certainly I, I came from a reading household. Um, my mother was blind, so she read books on tape. And as I got older, a big part of my reading life in my in the more intimate sphere of my of my life was sharing titles with her and exchanging with her but before that there was my english grandmother who introduced me to among others shakespeare and t.s eliot eliot of course not being british but she of course claiming him as such because he well he would have liked that <laughs> And yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, you and Ginger before this said, think about books that you, you know, that have affected you from the start. And I found myself noting Harriet the Spy and Nancy Drew and then Longfellow and Wordsworth and Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And then I kind of got up to my teens and my grandmother and I hit Shakespeare and Anna Karenina. And then I thought this is gonna be disastrous because I'm gonna have this, long, you know, scrolling thing that will never end. And then I'll just be talking and talking and talking, titles, titles, titles. And that's not so interesting as a way of thinking about the development of one's reading life to just list titles. You know, I think it's more about kind of vectors of influence, you know, moments that where a certain particular kind of light um, shown on the reading light life for me. And that had to do with my grandmother and her English influence. Um, and it had to do, I think, with um, my need for a certain kind of fantasy world, which meant that Tolkien and Lewis really worked for me at the time that I read them, fourth or fifth grade, I began sixth grade Tolkien. So I'll stop there. That's That was childhood for me, um, those, those particular influences of mother and grandmother rise to the floor, but there were others. I have a, oh, I'm sorry. I, I have a, that, go, go, go. I'll sorry, go after go. you. Well, during that time, did you conceive of being a writer yourself? Um, only very in very vague, really um, minimal, um, every now and then there'd be a, I'm going to be a poet because somehow that seemed to be the form that one should most aspire to. And, uh, you know, reading This is the Forest Primeval, I thought, okay, I'm in, I can do that. I can write things like that. The Murmuring Pines um, and Hemlocks. But then once, yeah, yeah, The Murmuring Pines and the Hemlocks, <laughs> yeah. And once, but once I started reading, you know, narrative, especially long form narrative, you know, and, and got hooked on that, it was like, no, I, I really do think 
think if I were going to write, it would be story. But it took a long time for that's a separate conversation. It took a long time for permission to write to set in. Mainly, I was just a feet first, heat seeking missile kind of reader. You know, I'm curious about um, the sound of language, and if you listened to books with your mother, and if you feel that that has influenced your writing, and if so, perhaps differently than the act of reading. Oh, well, that's interesting. I never listened with her. I would read to her sometimes if she liked, but she had the talking books from the Library of Congress, which is a service for the blind. And so she listened all the time and she would comment on the readers and what it was like to have a good reader versus a bad reader. So I was sensitive to that question through her, but I never liked and still don't like having things read to me much. That's not how I, how I absorb books. My English grandmother would recite poetry. She memorized a lot of it. And that was its own pleasure because she had this accent, you know, and even as a really little kid, I relished that. But um, reading remains for me an act done in silence. And I don't, I don't wear earplugs. Um, I have pretty bad tinnitus, so that's an aggravating question as well. I don't, I don't like to be read to. I don't like stuff in my ears in that manner. So I tend to just like to squirrel away somewhere. And you know, it's like a certain Sven said many years ago about reading being the sort of deep meditative possession of a book. And that's, that's how, I, how I feel about it. It's, it's a kind of done in solitude possession that is also a being possessed. Um, you know, it's that dance and I like to do it alone, so. I do too, actually. <laughs> and, and so I. Yeah. Um, Sven, how about you? What was it like in your home growing up? I'm very glad that Martha mentioned Nancy Drew because I was thinking the trajectory of my reading life went from Franklin W. Dixon and the Hardy Boys, you know, to Nabokov. And I woke up this morning thinking, reading, I mean, there's so many categories of reading that one lives inside of. And I just sort of thought, well, there's childhood reading of that sort, James Bond, and, you know, pure escape you know, fantasy. Then there's alienation at some point and the wanting to emulate alienated writers, which kicked in mid-teens. You know, college was dutiful coursework to get an English degree. Um, then 10 years of working in bookstores, which is, can't even describe how that impinges on the reading life, but uh, every day you're with books and people buying and talking. Then I got into reviewing and spent many years very dutifully reviewing. You know, it's a different kind of reading. It's reading with a certain intent that sort of led to teaching. And when you teach, um, I was thinking now of reading students as opposed to, you know, works that I would discuss with students. And in my capacity at Agni, um, reading submissions is a whole part of my life. But what I really, um, now that I'm free of many of those stages, uh, little cast offs, um, I read for myself, I read very selfishly, and I read to my preoccupations. And so because of this Nabokov project, but also because of, you know, my life as it continues after the project, um, my interests right now are very strong in um, thinking about memory, thinking about photography, and thinking about a certain kind of narrative, which is not an action narrative, but it's a sort of, I hope, I mean, I like writers who create a hypnotic internal element, and I stay near them when I'm in this mood. So I've been reading, you know, um, Let's see, uh, a writer I just discovered, Marina Stepanova, who writes about memory and reconstructing her whole family existence through different memories recovered. Um, Jeff Dyer, um, in the photography vein, John Zarkowski, who is a, you know, photography director at the Met and who's written 
these brilliant terse little <clears throat> descriptive passages on a whole sort of lifetime of uh, photographs. Four quartets, um, Spanish writer Javier Marias, I'm very fond of, uh, Dag Solstad, a Norwegian, who gets that particular thing. And I'll, I'll stop there, but those sort of encircle my preoccupation life. So I don't tend to sit down and read novels the way I did for so many years. You know, kind of new novel got to get it. So, you know, uh, read enough newspapers to know what's coming. And I think, is that something I'm going to read? Normally I would 10 years ago, I would have been waiting in line. But now I you know, sort of fly like a buzz, like a fly around a piece of mature fruit. <laughs> your Instagram, your, your Instagram account is gorgeous. Actually, it's interesting to hear the mention of photography. There's a practice um, in Shambhala that they call Mixong. I, I might be mispronouncing that, um, but it's this idea of capturing sort of a truth of existence in a single photo. And many of your images do that. It's I really enjoy. Um, I enjoy your Instagram presence, Sven. Thank you. M I X O N. <laughs> M I K S A N G. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Song. Yes. I'll check that out because that is sort of in the vein of things I think about. <clears throat> but yeah, photography came late in my life, probably uh, five years ago. But just the minute it came, it became compulsory or compulsive or something. Was it linked <laughs> to the really cell phone? I'm oh, sorry. Yes, oh, totally. Okay. I was given my first cell phone, I discovered, yeah. wow, point click, and you suddenly have a you know, sort of <laughs> the basic EDSC 101. Wow. <clears throat> you have a really great eye. I mean, many of the photos that you, you put up on your Instagram account have been so evocative that the textures, um, in particular, the textures and, and the framing and the overlay, um, I have to say that I've gone back and looked at a few of them again after the first, you know, you flip through Instagram and see them and then, you know, then move on. But, uh, you know, I think you've got a book there. That's a compliment I will take. And I am actually <clears throat> just at the very early stages of trying to put together a real, um, well, it's basically the idea, and I mentioned that uh, John Zarkowski in his book on photography um, is structured on three paragraphs. It's kind of a, like a sonnet form, three paragraphs to deal with the photograph. And I started playing with that. Um, first with just looking at the work of photographers I thought were great and trying to figure out <clears throat> what makes this photo work. And then sort of started pulling to the side and just putting up photos I'd taken and doing a much more associative um, set of riffs, but still in three paragraphs. And yesterday, on my 70th birthday, I went out and bought myself a sort of good photo printer. So now I'm going to pursue this and see oh, where it leads. Good. So it's the beginning of a possible project. I have no idea beyond that, but thank you for going back and looking at things twice. That's nice. Well, I'm just a few months behind you. My 70th is in January. So oh, here we march on. <laughs> um, how about you, uh, Martha? What are you reading and what inspires you? Well, actually, I'm just still sort of hung up on the question of, of books. First of all, books and image, and then, and then books and preoccupations. And that leads me to the question of sort of books and private game changers, if you will, things that for, for oneself as a, as a reader and or a writer, in my case, both were, were just kind of real reorganizers of possibility in my imagination or in my sense of craft or both. And I was, you know, I was asking myself, well, who have those been? And I mean, they're connected somewhat to books that I read in my, in my twenties, you know, when I read Calvino, when I read Virginia Woolf, <laughs> when I read Hermann Brach, when I read Milan Kundera, when I read um, late, a little later, Zabald, David Markson, Jose Saramago, Javier Marias, those, 
those were, you know, each, each of those in their own way were just such a, oh, okay, that opens a door that I hadn't seen opened in that way, even if it seemed that others had opened it um, before them. Um, there, there are writers I return to, uh, poets I return to, but I am always looking for the one who either addresses a preoccupation or somehow seems to give a different kind of permission, you know, or a different kind of opportunity, I guess, you know. Um, I, I do find I get bored more easily. I have less patience to return to that other word. Um, and I, I read in some ways I've been reading a little less than I used to. And sometimes I berate myself for that. And other times I think, no, well, I, I think of that wonderful line from a Barry Hanna. Uh, well, he gave, gave a talk at Bennington that then became a, a lecture published elsewhere. But, you know, he said, I, I find life too vivid for thought. Someone asked him about thinking and he said, I find life too vivid for thought. And you know, I I think we all understand that, and I think it can lead to the whole reluctant writing syndrome, or writer syndrome, where you just don't, you know, you'd rather sort of be be in the space of of the imagination than actually transcribe it or whatever. But to return to the books that give permission to do new stuff on the page, um, yeah, lately. Um, I can't say that a lot has done for me what someone was able to do when I first read it more than um, I, I admire a lot Dubrovka Ugresic, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, who works in, in a really interesting vein of memoir and history and, and sort of cultural criticism. Um, uh, Mohsin Hamid, I think, is a wonderful contemporary novelist. Um, and, Salvatore Shibona, I think his work, both um, The End and, and The Volunteer are really quite extraordinary uh, novels about the American experience. Um, Tabuki, I forgot to mention in the Italian vein, Tabuki's another one who sort of was a permission giver. His, the stories that my husband and I translated um, in the archipelago title, um, Time Ages in a Hurry, Speaking of Time, um, those stories do really interesting things formally and open my eyes a lot there. I just finished Paul Yoon's novel, just finished it this morning, Run Me to Earth, which is an incredibly disturbing uh, and compelling book about Laos and what horrible things happen there. So I'm always also looking to return to your comment, Jody, earlier about history and stories that are contextualized by, if not, completely defined by things going on historically. I think Yoon does it beautifully. It's a story about three childhood friends and it's it, his novel delves deeply into their interactions while never letting you not realize that it's all about the violence of war for children. Um, yeah, so I'll kind of stop there. Um, those are those are just that's it's like a scattershot thing when you talk about books because I'm going to get off this Zoom and think, well, why didn't I mention this and this and this and this? You know. <laughs> I wanted to just add a little thing to uh, the Barry Hanna quotation because it has a lot to do with the place of reading in my life now. I find that you know the mind changes as you get older, there is so much more to think about. Um, and I would also add to that, um, that very often I find my thinking too vivid for reading. I would rather sit and pursue a particular line of thought or a memory or, and that goes for writing too. Um, you know, that process is too vivid often to allow the other <clears throat> so it's not like you finish work on something and then go sit down with a great work by some admired author. I just can't switch like that. So I too read less, you know, definitely. But then one comes across a book like Claudia Rankin's Citizen, you know, which is a game changer and it has image. Um, and, and you get so excited, you know, you think, wow, someone has the skill, the nerve, the um, confidence to Put something like that together and you know I, I, I sometimes fear I'm, I'm wary of contemporary literature because there's just such a gush of it you know it's coming out all the time I'm always hearing about new novels new novels new novels and I get sort of exhausted by it and then but then I read something like Richard Powers the Overstory which just blew me away I mean oh, yeah. a, 
the way of thinking about what's going on in in the natural world um, for all for all of its it's problematic. It's a problematic book, but um, it it I just found it so extraordinarily powerful, and I feel now that it has in terms of my thinking when i when i'm experienced i'm i'm in a very um rural part of italy and when i'm thinking about what i'm seeing around me passages or moments from that book come back to me vividly they've they've interwoven into my sense of of uh, panic and terror <laughs> um, so this sort of terrible beauty you know that he, uh, Manages so um, I, I think too about books that have delighted me with their with their strangeness or their verb. And Sven, I owe you this one. You told me about Helen Dewitt's. Is it the Last Samurai or the Seventh Samurai? Which is this the really last, long book the last about samurai. mother and son. <laughs> and it's just it's so it's so great and weird and strange oh, yeah. and and so and I, and I you and I bonded on this one too, Sven. Um, Blaise Sandrars and particularly sky, which is this meditation uh -huh. sky. There's Kanausko on angels, a time for everything. I don't, I'm not a Kanaus guard, my struggle girl. It's not my jam, not for me, but the angel book just rocks. I mean, it's just amazing. So anyone who wants to tackle angels or, you know, preternaturally brilliant two-year-olds who learn languages and then you have to parent them, um, yeah, oh, there we go. There we go. Les Sendrar, yeah. Um, and you also, Sven, turned me on to um, David Mitchell's Black Swan Green, which is about the Falklands War as it's mm. perceived, as it was perceived in England by a kid who's a stutterer. And so anything that's that opens me to, to something that I'd completely <laughs> not had to think about or knew anything about, that's always welcome, even when I'm in one of my... I rallying life's too vivid you know I always um I, I that's actually been my experience every so often I've read a book and Overstreet was one of them that I realized had I not read it my life would have been less than without my even knowing it and to, to read something that takes you outside of what you're you know, outside of your world into a larger world is something that I really, truly value as, as a reader. Um, Sven, I'm curious, did you, have you read any of W.G. Zabel's books? All of them. I mean, yeah, he's I'm one sure. of my, I was almost going to say, I have to avoid talking about Zabel because he's, he's just kind of there and has been for years. And it's not, I would sit down and read a book by Zabel. At this point, I just open up, you know, any one of his books, Austerlitz, read for 20 pages and the tank is filled up again yeah. for that particular yeah. thing I'm needing. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, it was his work. Um, not that I would expect you to remember, but uh, that I, that was my, uh, yeah, oh yeah. So that was my uh, thesis when I graduated at Bennington. And, you know, I spoke about him and I spoke about his books and I read them, each of them like several times. The one that I think transported me the most was uh, The Rings of Saturn. Yeah. Me what made me think of it now, gosh, I've got this bizarre blinding light on me. Um, uh, what made me think of it is the photos it, that he would put into his narratives, which is something I would just, I think that would just be right up your alley. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's part of it for sure, for sure. Yeah. What I love about it is that they're not <clears throat> additions to or visual captions to what he's writing, but they're associative moods and vibes, sort of, you know, it's a very yeah. distant relation between the fuzzy image and what you're reading about in the text. Somehow that's very provocative for me. It's me as well. I would just like to take a moment to tell the uh, people who are with us that if they have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A at the bottom. I think I forgot to say this, or you can put them in the chat on the side and, and we can ask those. And you also, uh, let's see, Natalia Sarkissian says, hello, Martha. Mm -hmm. And Danuta Hink says, the beauty of it creates patience. So, so great, Sven, good to see you and hear you. <laughs> And we've had several requests for titles, which will all be, we'll put all of the titles on our bookshop page. 
within the next month. So one thing that I remember talking to Oskel about when I was at Bennington was he spoke of his go-to books, the mm -hmm. ones that he kept on his desk that were like the, the ones that both, um, that he looked at for structure and the ones that he just looked at for inspiration. And so do you guys have that sort of thing? Do you have your go-to books? <clears throat> for sure. <clears throat> With just because you mentioned Oskold, <clears throat> early on in our friendship, uh, we were talking about something and he said, well, if you want to um, get a real strong sense of how transitions work, read Penin, another Nabokov book. And I read it and it's true, there's something brilliant about the transitions, which you wouldn't think of if you were not yourself practicing this game possibly, but, uh, oh, I've been hugely influenced by any number of memoirists for one thing, because I'm always trying to figure out uh, <clears throat> ways to present, you know, the story of the self without being any number of obnoxious things. Um, you know, so for example, I learned about detail and focus from uh, Annie Dillard. And um, well, I won't be able, again, it's the old, uh, when I'm going down the stairs after this, the brilliant examples will fill my mind, but yeah, no, definite categorical. And I, I suppose when I mention all those books earlier, <clears throat> that's what I'm really reading for. I'm reading to see how they do the interior job and keep interest going, not just transmit someone's thoughts, which, you know, quickly, it's like transmitting someone's dreams. It's like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, every writer has a way to put a stamp on subjectivity. And I think uh, it's always something you just look to learn from. So. It's funny, I don't feel like I have the go-to book in the sense of kind of a manual of craft, although I certainly hear what and agree with what Sven just said about, you know, we read to find out how, how'd they pull that off, you know, how did, it's like my friend and, and uh, former colleague at Bennington, at uh, Adelphi used to say, what, you know, what makes the short hairs on the back of your neck stand up? And then, you know, try to figure out how that effect is achieved, you know, how does that how does that come to pass? So it's not like I go looking for the precise moment where I can sort of reverse engineer things, but there are stones and authors that are touchstones. And, and, and I find poets do, you know, function for me in a way as much pro writers do. I mean, without Dickinson, without mm -hmm. Eliot, um, that, you know, I, I have trouble imagining my life as a prose writer, but then, you know, for prose writers, I think about like when I read Kane, Gene Toomer's Kane, how that one just was, you know, such an astonishing, Baldwin, of course, um, for the essay that is also the story. As I'm looking for writers who have that kind of, um, robustness in their craft and in their vision um, that I get all of that all at once. And then I'm looking for the, the ones who, you know, I keep coming back to this sort of permission giving the ones who sort of say, well, you know, you really could do something. I think about Paget Powell's novel, I think it was he who wrote The Interrogative Mood, a novel written all in questions. Um, and it, it was problematic, but it was so admirable. I, I was, so, you know, I've never quite forgotten that someone attempted to pull that off. Most recently, I read a book called Savage Conversations by a Dakota Indian uh, woman named Leanne Howe, H-O-W-E. It's a verse drama and it, uh, it features a, a very crazy Mary Todd Lincoln. She was in fact institutionalized and there's, the, there's uh, Lincoln and um, an Indian and a rope, a dangling noose-like rope who are the characters in this. And it's, it's quite an astonishment. Um, I've never read anything like it. And so uh, those aren't touchstones, but I guess my, I have my, my touchstones, but then I have books that come in and, and function in a certain moment in a certain way to just 
kind of re-lubricate all the machinery, you know? Yeah. Um, so that you know, this, the, the, the sort of underlying engines of our inner narrative life or our inner, inner writing life. Yes, any questions you want to ask me about this? <clears throat> no. Was that a no? No, mine would be certainly Italy centered because you know I've spent a certain amount of time there in fairly similar small village settings, but obviously for much shorter periods. And just I found that reading was a whole other thing there, um, which I couldn't then reproduce stateside. Just not only being away, but being away where there's no recourse to almost any uh, temptation, electronic or otherwise, um, changed, you know, little islands of reading in my life here and there based on that. And I wonder about if Martha, <clears throat> in her newfound life, though you've been practicing for a long time, it's not like you just started. Um, do you mark a difference in your subjective life based mainly on change circumstance and place? Well, it's it's a great question, but I could turn it around and ask you as well, since it turns out that the two of us have recently moved. Now you've moved from city to country you know, within the past year, and, and I've moved mm -hmm. transcontinentally and I retired. So you there's win. a lot of um, my subjectivity just got put on the spin cycle here, mm -hmm. and I'm still waiting for the centrifuge to ring me out and to see kind of what limp pile of laundry is left of me um, that I can then hang up somehow differently to dry. Boy, was that an extendedly terrible metaphor, but I think you get the basic idea of just, I've been like, Whoa. That would you know. be like for the New Yorker when they used to block that metaphor. Right, yeah, it would be one of those. But I, I, I spent- one anyway. <laughs> I spent much of the summer waiting for a container full of books and furniture and things to arrive. So when you're reading life, is in one language and you're waiting for a container of books in that language to arrive and then you're struggling your way into some books in the other language it's it's I, i'm also dealing with that that i'm between languages a lot <clears throat> aside and, from translation do you read italian for pleasure a la jumpa lahiri you know have you <laughs> made the jumpa jump uh <clears throat> I, I lack her um command of the language i i speak pretty good Italian, but I am not fluent. And I can read and do read, but very slowly and I get frustrated. So I guess the short answer is I'm reading, but slowly and not everything, certainly in Italian. I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth. And those of you in the audience who may be tuning in from other places and other languages will probably be nodding in assent about how the, how the reading life complicates really interestingly when you're doing it in, in two languages. And, and it gets even weirder when you're comparing translations and stuff okay. like that, um, which is all super, super interesting, but also tiring. And so part of what I'm trying to figure out is sort of what kind of time do I want to allot as, as if these were always choiceful or mindful and they're not, sometimes you're just kind of staggering around led by impulse or sometimes, you know, the dahlias need watering or the cats need feeding and, you know, there's that. <laughs> but insofar as I can say I'm responding to some sort of um, thought through plan, I'm, I'm trying to honor my, my English language time as I need it, but not to just to, at the expense of the Italian because I want to improve my Italian mm. always. So. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to do things like read uh, journals, um, you know, Italian stuff that's shorter, that, um, but, uh, but I'm making my way through, inspired by Richard Powers, The Overstory, I'm wake, making my way through a, another book that has to do with trees and their relation to the larger set of questions. And <clears throat> so that's been, that's been good, hard but good. Yeah, yeah. For you, the new circumstance of being elsewhere, not the city. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that to me? I didn't. Quite yeah, yeah. The, the being again. elsewhere, the being out in Western Mass and not in the city, has that changed the reading life or your sense of reading? It's 
you know, it's changed my life and reading has moved along. Yeah. In pace with that. Um, but also, um, I think at a certain point, while not giving up even a whit of uh, ambition in terms of writing itself, um, <clears throat> you know, you have to factor in also just the psychology of getting older, not the physical diminution, but the, just the change of the priority changes. Um, and this move from Arlington to Amherst sort of signified in that direction. It's not just a geographical change, but um, it kind of marked <clears throat> opening the new chapter, which is much more internal, much more memory driven, blah, blah, blah. Partly because, you know, the friends network is all back in Boston mainly. So social life changed immediately, became much more solitary and much follows from that. So it's proximate, but I know we're running out of <laughs> running out of minutes. Is there a question that somebody? There is a question for Sven and Martha. Um, how do different books that you read influence your day? For example, writers you read in the morning or writers you read before going to sleep. Any difference? I think tremendous difference. Um, yeah, I think, you know, when I was in college, I would start the day by picking out what album was going to fit and just listen to that in my room and then carry it out into the day. Um, there's something similar that happens with reading if it's a period of reading things before the day gets going. Um, at night, it's mostly oh, slowing down. I don't <laughs> read deeply or long before turning out the light. My reading happens mostly before the sun goes down. So that's my answer. Oh, I just read when the spirit moves. Who knows when it is? I usually do read before uh, turning off the light. Um, that, that gives me great pleasure, always has. Just curled up in bed with a book <laughs> from the yeah. time I was a kid. I like it. <laughs> <clears throat> I guess oh, that... we both need hammocks. Do you have a hammock? <laughs> uh... Just for the fantasy of it. Okay, I'm going outside now with my three volume proof. So I'll be back later. <laughs> I would fall asleep. Yeah, of course. <laughs> not because of the proof, but because of the hammock. Well, I would use it to step up to the hammock and then promptly fall asleep. <laughs> I, like I, I do I do have a hammock. And I and I actually read um, nature writing outside in my hammock because I feel more in touch, you know, with the trees. Um, <laughs> so maybe place can matter. Yeah. yeah. But we are at six o'clock. So I thank you both um, so much for coming. This has just been wonderful. And it has um, been fun on many fronts. There have been lots of notable moments. Thank you, thank you, everybody.